This conference will now be recorded. With this, I'd like to get uh, started. Uh, welcome one and all to Nervous Design's webinar on developing high bandwidth, low latency electronic systems for AI and machine learning applications. I'm your host, Deepak Shankar. And in the next 50 to 55 minutes, I'll be walking you through various aspects that you need to take into consideration for AI and machine learning systems <coughs> and also how they need to be implemented. The key thing here is to try to visualize these systems before you take it down to implementation and at the same time evaluate the performance and the power consumption such that you need to create a product that is highly scalable and can also be used in a variety of situations. A uh, quick introduction to the agenda. We'll start off with what does it mean as architecture exploration? Then talk a little bit about systems engineering and systems modeling. Then get into talk about what are the libraries that are required to be able to efficiently conduct these types of modeling exercises. Then look at a few demonstrations and then look at what nervous design is all about. Now again, uh, before I get started on the main subject, I'd like to remind you that there is a chat window, so feel free to ask any question. We have application engineers standing by to answer all your questions. And as usual, all uh, everybody will be uh, put on chat, so you would uh, not be able, you would not be uh, you know, creating echoes or disturbances for anybody else. Now let's look at exploration the uh, of the. Uh, Let's look at exploration of these electronic systems. If you look at the current approach, you always end up using some sort of an analytical model. It can be an Excel spreadsheet, or you can be doing a worst case execution plan. Now, one of the things that uh, both of these have is that they're both highly inaccurate. Also, the probability of exactly where the results lie is too diverse, which means the probability range is way too far. The other way to do it is to try to build prototypes based on a specification that is the best effort or based on prior projects. The problem is prototypes take too long and you can't do a whole lot of uh, exploration. Like for example, if I decide I want to replace one core with another core, or I want to replace a different type of a memory structure, or I want to you know, partition it and I want to add another pro processor which has multiple cores can be done. So very hard to do any sort of trade-off with prototype. So what we are proposing is really adding a systems engineering layer over and about this, or after this analytical approach. So what we do at this time is to create a virtual prototype in the systems engineering environment. This virtual prototype tends to be extremely accurate with detailed knowledge of the implementation but sufficiently accurate that you don't have to spend a lot of effort to, to uh, you know, work, put in all the details of your algorithms, your controls, your math, your, you know, your implementation level details. All of those can be abstracted and include things like hardware, software, art costs, networks, chassis, backbones, the power systems. All of those can be integrated into the same system. So now let's look at a traditional approach. In a traditional approach, when you're trying to do any sort of power analysis, what you do is you take a list of all the devices and then you look at all the different states they are and the number of cycles. And typically there are two things you might do. One is you might take all of them, take the average, and then add up the average and say this is the number. Or you might look for the highest number, put in the highest number, and then add them up and give you the value. Both of them are extremely far. The first one over oversubscribes the heat and thermal impacts, which means you're going to be spending a significant amount of money on your cooling cost, on your thermal structure, your mechanicals, things like that. The average tends not to be very good because it really doesn't take into consideration what is the application running and also what is the workload that is being fed into the system. So both of those have significant limitations that prevent you from, uh, from being able to uh, get a clear picture of what it is that your system is doing. Now, if you take the proposed approach, what we're proposing is we use the same spreadsheet 
or the word trace file that you might already have from a previous project. You feed that into a system architecture model. And then what you do is you, uh, you know, generate reports out of it, which are now more based on detailed information about the model. I'm not going to go into details right now on the model, because we're going to talk about that uh, afterwards. But you're putting in all the details into the system, and from this you're generating reports. So for example, this can be looked at as a power report or a performance report for like latency to complete processing of an image, things like that. So you're essentially, whatever you've done in your analytical approach, you're reusing those to kickstart the actual analysis and the systems engineering level that gets you your accuracy. Now, what are the types of analysis and experiments you can do with these types of systems? First and foremost is you understand the connectivity both at the software application level, but also at the hardware level of how all the boxes are connected together, what is the back plane? What are the uh, boats connected to these chassis? These technical details of what it is that you're looking at would include timing, throughput, the uh, instantaneous power consumption, the juice, and of course, the functional correctness, which is, are my algorithms being evaluated correctly? Then, of course, you want to measure the latency between all the uh, network interfaces and the process. So, for example, if, say, you, this is a box that's in a data center processing artificial intelligence of input coming in, say, from a handheld device or a variable or even like a vehicle, what happens is you want to know how much time it took from the time it came in at your network interface, going through all the processing, the storage, and then coming out. The second aspect is really looking for what are the opportunities for hardware acceleration. What that means is you're looking for how can I speed up my system such that I can uh, you know, accelerate the, uh, you know, the application and get improved performance by, by just doing some small increments. It could be on an FPGA, or you could add new instructions to your uh, particular uh, core and, uh, and you know, improve the uh, performance right there. So a number of strategies you can evolve. And of course, as part of systems engineering, you would experiment with all the strategies to figure out what, which is the best one. Now, this partitioning of your application can be spread across multi-core, multi-processor, multi-chassis, uh, and as I said, you can add acceleration. Of course, one of the other things you can also look at is the, at the expansion to emerging technologies, new ways to implement your AI ML. So, for example, implementing it as analog, or for example, utilizing a different processor family, or uh, changing the sequence, how you do your multiply, uh, uh, add, and accumulate. You can look at all of these aspects right there. Now, question comes up, hey, I can do all of this by programming it out and trying it out in C++. Why deploy the new approach? First and foremost, you're really eliminating all surprises before integration. So you've got complete visibility into the end-to-end -end system operation from the host through the network, interface card, goes through all the processing, comes out back to the host. You can actually get a complete end-to-end -end visibility into what's happening. The other one is looking at it at a request or a packet or a signal level, looking at how protocols impacted, looking at how hardware software impacts those decisions, including the math that goes into your AI or ML processing. The other aspect is determining the requirements for the hardware and for the network components. So with this, what I mean is, you're trying to identify if I use this clock speed with this bus, with this uh, number of processors, you know, can I meet my timing deadlines? Am I gonna have any limitations in terms of creating any deadlocks, which means you know, I don't have any resources or prior tasks are not completed so the next task can take over. So this new approach takes care of all of these into consideration before you start your development. So maybe you can even, once you get the specification fully validated by this approach, can even move directly into creating a prototype. So you don't even have to go to an intermediate stage, and then you can go off and hand it off to your development team to say, hey, go build this product. Now, as I mentioned again, uh, for some of the people that joined new, you can ask any uh, questions right now, and uh, the chat window on the right hand side and uh, people are standing by to uh, 
answer any of your questions. Now, let's get into a little bit on the system modeling itself. Now that you understand the problem and how you can use it and what is the deployment strategy. System architecture modeling really looks at two, three aspects. The application, the network, which is the backplane and the connectivity and the communication with the host, and the hardware architecture. So if you look at the network topology, what can happen is you typically have large number of channels, can be thousands, can be millions of channels coming in with some sort of a scheduling which goes through a mux. There might be some internal uh, processing, can be uh, flow control, can be any uh, sort of aptitude. And then at some point you come out on an external, go out on the output e to the sports. So what you're really interested in is how many of these channels can I handle, how much of data, and you know what is the best scheduling algorithm that I can deploy. So what happens is you construct a model. So if you notice it's a one-to-one -one mapping. You can see there's your ability to generate a large number of channels. You can see those are my uh, queues with my ingress ports, which do my uh, code over here uh, for the scheduling. Of course, these are the intermediate stages. And then finally, you have the uh, egress queue on the other side. Of course, you can generate the latency stats. You can generate buffer occupancy. Plus, you can generate a variety of uh, throughput, uh, latency, number, number of tasks completed, all of those as well. So if you look at a model that we're going to take a look at right now, this is the modeling environment of Visual Sim. We have these libraries on the left-hand side, anything from, say, a resource, which is a system, to a traffic, to, uh, to inter interfaces, to uh, processes. So there's a variety of library blocks that can be used that can address every scenario. Because we've got a huge library, and you can always say, hey, I don't need such a huge library. But in reality, you might move from one project to another project, and you might need a different set of IP for the next project. Like, Today you might need DDR4, tomorrow you might need HPM 2.0. So the big library really allows you to uh, to be able to uh, <clears throat> to be able to scope out and look at uh, you know your over your set of applications and uh, and be able to quickly assemble up your model. So what I'm going to do now is not go into the details of the model, but rather I'm going to click on the go button. There's a variety of statistics that are going to be generated. Of course, we saw the latencies and we saw the buffer occupancy. And here you can actually see for each of them what's the, uh, you know, how much is the buffering. Right now you don't see any sort of buffering. So actually the system is pretty good except for this one particular case. This is the uh, ingress buffering. When we look at the egress buffering, we'll start seeing that some of these have started to accumulate a lot of buffers. And that's what you see in the buffer occupancy right over here. Of course, if you look at the histogram, you can see most of it is right over here. There's only a small, so a pretty long tail that uh, shows you, you know, like where's the latency for all the other things. But the majority right over here, which indicates it's all right down here, except for the small item. Now, variety of things I can try out. These are all mathematical processes, very similar to AI and artificial uh, intelligence. So what I can do is, you know, for example, I can add the number of ingresses. So I can say, you know, like write this, I'll let me put 25 of these. Now let me go ahead and rerun them and see what happens. Now notice here, when I increase the number of uh, channels, which means the same amount of traffic is going across a larger number of channels, the buffering call went down. So it went from about 26, 27, to go down to about 14. And of course, you can look at uh, you know, the uh, latency, which is also dropped, the peak latency. The, uh, the average is still about the same, but the peak has gone down a little bit too. So using this, you can get what your back plane needs to be. What's your end-to-end -end from the ingress to the egress side of your AI or ML or any high bandwidth uh, application? Because this is the data that's coming into the system. Part two is really trying to understand what is the algorithms that are being placed inside of this. So for example, here we have an algorithm which in this particular case looks at first one is a round robin, but the other one is a deficit round robin. So two different types of scheduling. What, I'm do, what I want to do now 
is look at a little more detail. So this is the, uh, the round robin application. So we're going to focus on that one. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, sorry about that. We're going to uh, and look at how was the code executed. So you can see all the addresses. You can see the number of times each line of code was executed. And what was the mean time that it took to execute each line? So what this is telling you is it's telling you exactly how my code is getting executed. Where is my bottleneck in my software? So notice we started off with the networking, which is the ingress, egress, the flow control across the uh, system. Now we're looking at the software application and seeing, you know, where's the bottleneck? So as you can see, even though this is being executed 6,000 times, the amount of time it takes each time is very, very small. But this one over here, it's a wait process. That one takes a long time. So we know that this is a potential bottleneck or even someone, something like this because you know, it's an if else statement, but it takes a huge amount of time here and also runs for a considerable amount of time. So this would be something that I would like to try to optimize. Now, looking at another way, we kind of generated some pseudo code to resemble each of those functions. So there's an, uh, values of the pseudo code, and this was the sequence based on that execution. This was the sequence that was executed. And also you can see the line, the order in which the sequence was executed. How did this help? This tells me a few different things. One is, it tells me whether the uh, code is executing correctly. From, for a set of data, is this sequence being executed correctly? If it is, then I know my system is working correctly. If the execution is not correct, then I know I had some sort of a problem right there. So it allows me to not only see if the code is functionally doing its uh, application, like you know, the scheduling algorithm is correct, but also try to identify where the code bottleneck is, where is the uh, you know the performance limitations, you know, how much time each code is being executed, how many times it's executed, also whether the sequences are correct, and also kind of creating a pseudo code so that you can translate those to instructions as well. So you, know, you saw the networking, you saw the software. Now we're going to look at the third aspect, which is the hardware. So what do we have over here? We really have a hardware system. So this is your AI. It can be done on an SOC or it can be done as a full system. So in this particular case, we've got two processors, a DSP and an IO, and they're separated out by multiple buses and a bridge. What we're trying to do is we've got to an application with tasks and transfer time between the tasks. Transfer meaning that it's going from one core or one processor to another processor, or maybe across uh, chassis to another box. So these are the transfer times. So what you have as a goal is you want to minimize the transfer latency and have more time for the processing, which means your memory, your data movement, all of those has to be less than the actual time you're involved in processing. So you're getting maximum efficiency out of your system. Of course, the other end is you also want to minimize your power consumption. So one of the big ways how you can reduce the power consumption as well. Now, the application by itself is really useless. You really need to tell it how much of requests are coming in, how fast these requests are coming in, what is the size of data, what is the requirement for each of the requests. Only when you provide all of that significant data, you can actually provide, tell you exactly what is happening, what's going to happen in my system. Now, when I look at this uh, in a particular thing, this is that variable input data rate. So that's the one that's feeding it to tell it what exactly needs to be done. Now, when I do the mapping, each one of these tasks could be mapped on a different item, and based on that, the transfers can be completely different. Similarly, if I had other applications, their transfers are also be different. So guess what happens? This is where we're taking a model that has been uh, created as a block diagram <clears throat> along with the application and the information, and we're creating a visual sim model out of it. So here, you see the CPU 1, 2, DSP, IO, the bus 1, bus 2, and bridge. So that's my hardware architecture. We took library blocks from, the, from these uh, live folders over here, drag and drop them, set their parameters, and created the unique components. Now, the software, 
The software is divided into three portions that we saw earlier. We have these, which are called the tasks, and then we have the transfers, and then we have the workload that triggers them. So each one of those are set up with a unique set of parameters. Outside of this, there's a few more things that can be set up for parameters. These are the ones we want to vary. So what can be varied? You can vary the mapping of the tasks. You can vary the processing time. So you can vary the number of cycles. So we increase the number of cycles, either means you're going to do more work, or you're going for a slower process. I'm sorry, for a slower uh, device. If you're, uh, and also related to that is your power consumption. If you go with a slower device, or to have less amount of processing on any bus or uh, bridge, the amount of power consumed is going to go down. It's not going to be an active state with these stand, but eventually with an idle state. So then, of course, you have your power, which is specifying for each device, for each state, what's the power consumed. Then, of course, the last thing is all the statistics that you want to generate. So if you look at this, we ran the simulation, we ran two different modes. One is 200, and the other one is 490 hertz for the bus. And what we're trying to see is trying to see which one is in a more contained, narrower range that's below a threshold. Now, in this particular case, what we see is, obviously, the 400 megahertz is in a much lower range. But the problem we face here is that we have these uh, irrational activities or unpredictable activities that are causing it to be significantly high, especially at this point over here. So it's significantly above the threshold. So as a result of that, two things have to happen. Either you need to re-engineer the architecture to figure out why you're having that bottleneck and maybe try to do some offsetting, or you have to go for lower bus, which means you have other impacts, but at least you won't, you won't be above the threshold. Always in most systems, it's not about being the fastest. It's about meeting those thresholds or meeting those timing deadlines, which are more important. A lot of times we have seen where you can over-design your system, you know, like do an overwork of the um, of your buffering, and then find out that your latency has gone up. So this ensures that you're really doing a trade-off between all the different elements that go to make your decision. Now, as I keep going, again, as I mentioned, anyone having questions, go ahead and feel free to uh, ask ask your questions in the uh, uh, in the chat window. Uh, of course, there's a lot of capabilities that we have today. We are only focusing on what it takes to implement AI and machine learning. There are other applications. We can take it offline. We can discuss that. But for example, we do have a huge amount of uh, FPGA implementation libraries. But since we decided we're going to implement this in a box today, we're not talking about the FPGA model. Yet. Now, Let's take a look at the libraries and some of the architecture challenges that are associated with doing AI ML based high bandwidth, uh, low latency type designs. Now, this here is the library structure. As you can see, we have everything from traffic generators to uh, SOC based components to systems to full networks, uh, of course, our process and uh, a variety of processes. So, Pretty much anything you want, you can assemble up in your system and get it up and running. Now, we also have what are called templates. Templates are starting from models for a variety of applications. We've got over 150 templates that are you know, specific for different application segments that can also accelerate your development. So anything from you know, like a, a set of boxes for AI that work on a 5G network or a set of boxes that might go into uh, a data center, or a set of boxes that might go into an uh, automotive system. So we get templates that go into all of those things. And of course, there's a lot of variety of other templates as well. Now, let's take a look at the challenges. What are the engineering challenges that we're trying to address within this uh, AI-based system? Now, the, uh, when you look at the uh, systems engineering, which is the highest level, which is typically where you're using analytical tools, spreadsheets, worst case execution time, you're looking at the top level of 
the entire system. So you want to capture the data flow, the application sequence, and every single hardware component or the architecture component is instantiated as a resource. Typically, resources have like clock speeds, schedulers, uh, buffers, context switching time, uh, the preemption, things like that. Then what you do is you generate the early statistics there and uh, look at primarily what's your latencies and what's your throughput. Uh, power is, of course, one of the items that we recommend you run through very early in the design process because if the system is going into a handheld or even into a data center, the operational cost becomes a big factor to consider. Now, once you have the system level and once you know this is what the end-to-end -end specification is, you want to go to the next level, which is really looking at the hardware software selection. So what you want to look at is, you know, based on the data flow and based on that application sequence and based on what you found out from the system resource, you try to start selecting processors, number of cores, the memories, the uh, accelerators. You start providing different types of information into your model. Essentially what that means is you're adding more and more details into the model to really start structuring the system. So when I go ahead and look at the design, I'm picking a simple one now. What you have over here is the host. So when I open the host, which is called the hierarchical block, you can see it's generating uh, different types of AI, uh, different types of sensor requests. It comes into the GPU. First, it gets stored into the uh, external memory right over there, and it comes across the PCIe, and then it goes into the memory. And of course, you know, there's also a weighted FIFO, and it puts it into the you know, unified buffer. Once the buffer is full, it's going to trigger the matrix multiply unit, accumulate activation, completes, it goes through the loop to get the next set of data. What are the things you can change here? You can change the speed of the matrix multiplication. You can change the, uh, you know, how you want the pipeline to be set up. You can change the size of the buffer. So there's a lot of variables that can be modified here that can impact the performance of your system. So you may want to try out different experiments where you're now starting to get from a thing which is just high level latency calculation to putting in the actual values. So here, for example, PCI, it's a cycle active implementation. Why is this important? If you notice in the earlier thing you found when we went from 200 to 400 megahertz, the latency actually increased in certain steps. What was happening? What was happening was the uh, one of the CPUs is overloaded. It's at 90%. So just like this scenario over here, it's pumping more data into that CPU. Buffer occupancy is increasing. During those periods, it's pumping a large amount of data. And so you're seeing those spikes at those regular intervals. So if you uh, increase the clock speed of the bus, obviously you have to consider increasing the clock speed of the, mem of the processor as well, so that it can handle the extra workload that the, uh, that the bus is sending through. Now that you've gotten an idea of the hardware software, the next question comes back is how do you integrate the whole system? Because now it's no longer just a single box. It's really a network of boxes. How do you put all these boxes together? So we're going to look at another design. Looks like I don't have another design, so I'm going to open up a, a model to show you what another design would look like. So here is a network which is made up of many sensors, plus I have these uh, hardware boxes that are going to actually do the processor. In this case, we're using an A53 box from, uh, uh, from ARM. It's an ARM processor, so you can see over here the, uh, the hardware with VMAs, memories, and uh, caches. And uh, this one here is actually going to do the processing. Now, you also have the other sensors, you also have other types of processing that's also happening in the same system. So like going back to what we were discussing earlier, it's all about experimenting with different 
mapping strategies and trying to reuse the systems engineering flow that we saw over here for the next level design. So once you have all of this assembled, you're happy with the block diagram, you're happy with the latency and power, then you take it to the next level of looking, how do I spec spec generate the specification for integration in test cases and uses? So for example, in this particular design, what I plan to do now is I plan to export. So I'm going to uh, specify that I want to export it over to uh, something over here. I'm going to give a nice background color to this system. I do a PNG. So now what it's going to do is the, uh, the tool is going to generate documentation from the entire system and it's going to create a single document that has information about the flows, the parameter values, has information about the uh, statistics that are in the model. It's going to give you all of that information as part of your documentation that you can then hand over to your implementation team. And that's where, you know, at the integration level, the work is started off with the systems engineering, gets carried to hardware software, and finally goes down to the uh, integration team, that the integration team can now say, hey, I understand this, I see exactly what the flow is, I see what's the parameter for each entity, without having any modeling experience, without doing any modeling, it's just looking into their documents. That's where they're getting the data from. So they have all of that information readily available. Now, while that's uh, generating the documentation, we'll start talking about any other questions that people might have. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, feed them into the, uh, into the, design, into the uh, chat window and we'll be happy to answer the questions. Okay, so now we have the, uh, the documentation generated. So you can see exactly, they can see what the connectivity is between all the boxes, all the sensors, the back, uh, the backbones, everything is shown right over here. Now, obviously, I can go into this uh, block over here, and I can go in here, and I can see what the specification is for the A73 or A53. Similarly, I can go up and look at you know what the memory spec is, so I know exactly which memory I'm purchasing for this particular application. Now, what can I also do? I can also look at, uh, for example, um, right over here. I can look at uh, what was the statistics. So, for example, here I can see exactly what the average power was for that particular system. Now, I can also look at this and see what the battery information was. So now you're no longer looking at the hardware software. You're also looking at the battery information as well, especially in you know, the critical applications where power is very power sensitive. So documentation is essentially generated right out of the model once you're done with all your work. So now you can hand this off to anybody that needs to be, it needs to have information about how to do the development. Now, one of the things with AI and ML, which is very critical, is the fact that a lot of it involves mathematical functions and you need to do these extremely fast because there are always a lot of bottlenecks with memory access. So how do you do the allocation? There's a number of ways you can do an allocation. So here, for example, we were looking at an image-based application for AI ML. Uh, now, part of it is done in, um, uh, in analog, and the rest of it is done in hardware. So we're actually modeling all of it at the, uh, you know, at the uh, system level as, uh, as discrete uh, activities. Now, you can see all of the different control signals, the clocking, you can see the actual processing. So this is the, uh, the, um, the DAX that send out the mixture, the waveform amplifier, and then send it out of its own world. So what you have over here is you're looking at the correctness of the AI mathematics that you've been involved in. So this is the first level of trying to understand what that math is really doing. Now, the way you can correct those is you can look at not just the, uh, you know, the parameters associated with the map, but also you can get other statistics like power, 
and you know what was the uh, performance you can capture all of those kind of characteristics as well as part of your mathematical functional model so you saw how an overall system can be put in you look at the map you can understand how it needs to be implemented look at the functional correctness now we want to look at the network planning because today most of the systems that use ai are going to be in a highly distributed environment either the processing is highly distributed like for example i could store my data on a google cloud and i can do the processing on aws or for example i can do the uh, immediate filtering on the in the car and maybe the rest of the actual processing in the data center so there's always going to be a lot of network interactions here now here what you're looking at is you know you see all your endpoints and they go through and get to the end device. So they can go across a large number of, number of channels and large number of gateways and links before you get to the final destination, which is your data center, and of course coming back. So you want to be able to capture this as well to be able to understand if I send this out in this size, for this amount of processing, for this uh, you know, type of data, what is my response time? What's my round trip delay on the network? So you can even do those kind of analysis. Now, what are the specific, specific uh, uh, you know, statistics or plotting that you want to generate? First and foremost is, the, uh, is looking at the latency from gateway to gateway or looking at client server or client master kind of uh, response times. Of course, the other one is you want to look at what is the communication stack activity, what is happening on the communication stack. The other aspect is, you know, when you have these network interfaces, there's going to be different types of scheduling on the network. So for example, you might have best effort Ethernet is based on type of service, or you might have uh, audio video bridging type structures, or you might have control uh, data timing uh, or time sensitive networking. Any of those kind of attributes that are there. And you want to look at, you know, if I send this data across these different types of uh, uh, scheduling or uh, different types of channels, how does my performance get impacted? How is my response time to the time the host made a request, to the time I got the processing, and then came all the way back? Of course, you can look at other aspects like, you know, if I do a broadcast versus a multicast, is there any improvement? Uh, you know, how does clock jitters increase or decrease my latency? Most likely it'll increase your latency, not to do a decrease, but, you know, is it possible that it can decrease because you found a clock jitter which went over like 10 microseconds, for example? How does that impact my system? Now, this is at the overall system where you're putting all the chassis together and they've got a remote host that is sending in a request and you're getting data back. Now, there's also another piece which is really inside of the processor or inside of your SOC that's doing the actual mathematical computation. Now, the reason most times it's done in FPGA or SOC is primarily because of the fact that the amount of processing that's required is significant. So here, for example, you can see I have all these different routers. So for example, this is the expansion of the router, this one here shows me the processor right here. So what do I have now? I do have the ability to uh, you know, create the underlying architecture of my entire system, incorporate the processor, have an instruction sequence to emulate a particular application, and then see what the behavior is in, in this overall network topology. So a lot of uh, AI and ML applications tend to be implemented using some sort of a network on chip on the back plane. Now, now that we've seen different aspects, now let's focus on the software architecture and the mapping the hardware. Typically the software, or even you can not even call it software, call it the application, is defined using a task graph. So here what we see is we have three uh, in, uh, inputs, we have three, uh, I'm sorry, we have three outputs, I'm sorry, two outputs, two outputs, three uh, instances of each one of these. And then of course, when it comes out, you have a single interface to see as well. Now, what's happening here? We have first 
uh, limit the auto currency to three. So which means I can't have more than three interfaces for B that you had generated for each. So this is what my uh, system looks like right here. So I come in, I go into one of these, next one, next one, and then I start generating all these different uh, links to B, and then finally B send it to C. So if one of these Bs does not get completed, C never gets started, which is a typical deadlock in most software applications. And you want to be able to detect that early in the design process, not after you've written the code, but way earlier in the design process. Now, here's a model, I'm not going to go into detail, but here's a model of the uh, TaskRap and Visual Sim. You can notice there are some differences from in this analytical model that we're used to, which is, I got the traffic, I got the queues, but here, the queue doesn't pop until there's space in any one of the stages. It's very important to understand that, you know, from here I go to stage one, but then stage one has to move to stage two and move to stage three. But if those don't have enough bandwidth, that means either no buffering or no processing capacity, it doesn't matter, the whole system is stuck until uh, you know one of them starts uh, freeing up data. And of course, once they freed up data, they need to feed it on to the next level, which needs to do its processing and then come out as C1 right over here. So you can see the model, the block diagram we saw there of the task graph is now being modeled into a visual sim system. Now, another type of a design in this particular case is what's called a, a software radar system. Now, radars are being used in a variety of applications. They're being used in cars, in weather reporting, in, uh, in defense and space applications, uh, even in commercial airline or commercial uh, shipping. They all use different forms of uh, radar. So that's one of the reasons why we picked uh, radar as one of the options right over here. Now, when I look at this, you can see there's a variety of mathematical processing that is happening right here for the radar. So when I look at a block diagram, I figure this is going to be the flow for that particular radar. And we have a block called the dispatch block. How does that help? The dispatch block determines for each one of these forks, which is the target hardware that it needs to be implemented. Now, the interesting thing is we don't believe anything to chance. So what we do is, despite of this thing that being a full radar system, we tend to uh, try to automate some of these things. What that means is we actually, uh, you know, like handhold it. And once it's ready to escape to say, yep, I can, uh, you know, I can do it myself. I, we could uh, you know, automate that process of trying to figure out, where, you know, how do I do the allocation? Once I've done it, provide a report to say, this is how the mapping took place in my system. Now, the, uh, if you look at this, this is the hardware. So the processor L1, L2, L3 goes to the PCIe to the DDR1. I'm sorry, to the DDR4. Um, so when the request comes in, it goes through the whole stage. Now, if I was at the systems engineering level, it would just be a hit miss ratio for each one. If I'm at the hardware software level, I replace that with some sort of a timing model or even it could be accessing actual addresses. So it allows you to do that. Now, this particular case, we have two block diagrams. One is x86 based, and the other is a DSP based. Okay. Now, what am I doing? I'm looking at a comparative figure of what's happening in my system. What you notice with the DSP based architecture is the fact that I've got multiple things waiting here. Whenever something comes, immediately it gets processed. There's no waiting time. You can also see the latency. I mean, the throughput is far more predictable in this versus on the TIDSP where there's a lot of sawtooth and a lot of fluctuations that are being created. So it allows you to compare between different implementations of your software and then make the decision what's, which one is the best. Now, this is a worldwide problem, which is, you know, you can get a variety of faults. Faults can be malicious or faults can be just a function of the system. So, for example, over here, if you look, these two are implement, uh, are you know, like targeting the ECU hardware in a fairly different sequence, even though the traffic, the use case, everything is the same between the two systems. 
what is happening here is there's been a fault introduced, and there are two types of faults that have been introduced. Um, So here what you're seeing is a large number of sensors, and this plot alone, this one alone, has the ECU, the uh, communication link, the uh, you know the RTOS scheduler, the uh, the runtime environment with its own uh, library. I'm sorry, its own registers, and of course the runner books. So what you have here is the ability for you to configure everything using these tables, anything from you know, what's my schedule table for each of the tasks to, uh, you know, what is the event that is, you know, what is the pre-existing event that has to happen before this block gets triggered. So there are those things also. So for example, if you see that something never leaves, first thing you want to check is if the pre-request is uh, live. For example, it might be that this particular function that's going out is the one that has to feed back the pre-request. So if it's not available, it will not be able to continue the system. I'm sorry, it will not be able to uh, continue from that point onwards, and there's a deadlock that is formed. Now, I'm going to take a short break at this point and answer a few of the questions that have come in. Um, one of the questions is uh, how do you validate the artificial intelligence and machine learning models with the real data? There are two ways you can validate it. The first is before you uh, get started, you probably already have some benchmarks either from published papers or from an existing system. So you build up the baseline to meet that performance. Once you have that, you know that this works correctly and it's going to give you the results, maximum results. Then you start building your increments. So every time you build a small increment, we call it a hierarchical. Every time you add a hierarchical increment, we test it again and see if it's reasonable over the previous case that we had. And if it is, then you say, okay, that looks fine, and uh, we can move forward to the next one. So there is a methodology to allow you to do that. Now, the question is, uh, are simulation results available in both VHDL for functional and uh, synthesis? Now, the results are available in a variety of formats. The standard text format, CSV, BCD format, and what you can do is two things. One, I already showed you that you can generate the uh, documentation. But two, you can generate the uh, traffic, generate the statistics, generate the expected results, all of those in a format Then you can then use for verification downstream. Now, obviously, these models are not at a stage where they can just be press button and it goes to implementation. These are architecture models. So you're looking at the timing, you're looking at the power. Um, so it's not really meant for synthesis right out of the model because you're not putting in the actual math algorithms, you're not putting the actual control. Because we are, you already weighed down and you already made a lot of decisions. Here you're still making a lot of the decisions and trying to come up with what's my latency power, throughput, questions like those. So if people have any more questions, go ahead and feel free to answer those questions. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and run the simulation. And here you can see it's very symmetrical. So this is when these, uh, you know, the uh, uh, EC1 was active, the blue is when the EC2 was active. This shows me what my latency, I mean what my throughput is on EC1 and 2. So as you can see, EC1 is only about 25% utilized while EC2 is almost 85% or 83% utilized. But there's really no measurable buffer. Now, what I can do is, same model, I'm going to introduce faults in the model. There are two types of faults. One is, I'm going to swap out one of the runnables, which is one of the instances of code, and replace it with something else. That's one thing. The second thing is, the task table that we have over here, which has all these, I'm going to muddle it up and modify it to integrate some other tasks into these task tables. So those are two. Now, we've got over uh, 60 or 70 different types of failures that we have. These are just one or two of those failures that I'm showing you. And of course, 
failure to spread across hardware, software, RCOS, and networking. So there are like quite a wide spectrum of failures. Now, when I added the errors, two things pop up. Now you notice here, it's no longer the same methodology that or the same values that were there when we saw it earlier. This looks a little different. But here's the kicker. You have a concept called ready, ready to run, and execute or run. Now, ready means I got the trigger to start this code to execute, but then wait. The data is not available because it hasn't arrived from the sensor, or the uh, you know, there's no resource available. So it starts waiting. One thing you notice when we introduce a fault, this number starts going up. This keeps on piling up. So which means there is buffering associated with that particular uh, task, and so the task is actually being held back because either because there's no resources or you have some uh, you know pre-existing task that has not completed. Of course, here the other thing you can see is the increase in the uh, buffering. So what this tells me is the fact that you know over time I'm going to actually run out of buffer space and it's going to start dropping data. So when I introduce those faults, you can see exactly where the system bottlenecks. And obviously it's this one here, which is cross the two because the utilization was down here, and when we made the change, we got it bumped up to up here. Now, let's look at the semiconductor aspect. So we looked at the network, the software, the hardware. Now we're going to look at the semiconductor aspect of the design. Now, we implemented the TP1 and TP3. Uh, these are tensor processing units from, uh, our, from Google. Uh, you can see the basic uh, flow diagram. Here's the host, that's the TPU. And the TPU is drawn up here, so you can actually see what the uh, you know, request coming into the uh, access the PCIe goes to the weighted FICO, weighted uh, and into the buffer. Actually, these things first, the initial data, the coefficients go to the uh, weighted FICO, and then the data comes into the buffer, and then it's sent out to the main multiply, accumulate, and uh, activate. Now, what we're going to look at is what is the end to end data scene. And of course, you know, where is the accumulated latency? Now, here it's completely red, so obviously, what this tells me is people were like uh, out there uh, doing huge amount of processing, which means they're out of their cars or out outside, which means they're not following social distancing and, uh, you know, the lockdown. But, you know, in this case, that's what we're seeing here. Now, notice TC, uh, TPU1 was really a simple network with weighted unified buffers and a whole bunch of matrix multiply, accumulate, and uh, uh, activate. When you look at uh, TPU3, which has come out recently, now we have a direct connection into the uh, Axi bus. So what that means is that I no longer need the, uh, the intermediate stages. I can just go directly to the axle, you know, to the uh, uh, to the AI data center, and be able to uh, immediately visualize where the problem is. Also, I can start replacing some of these components with hardware components. So, for example, if I have an FPGA board, I can replace, say, the axle and the memory controller into the AXI board, and then try different scenarios, not just the scenarios we did, but a whole variety of other scenarios to see if it passes all of those cases. If it doesn't, we know it's in trouble and we need to build something else for it. Now, we saw how the tensors process both in the uh, data center and also in the host. But you also want to look at other types of chips, which are like both mainstream. You have a back then AXI bus, well understood, but still want to model. And then, of course, you have the accelerators, the processors, the memory, the. Uh... <coughs> now, moving over to this particular model. So here's what we're seeing right over here. Uh, what you have here is the uh, block diagram, and you can see this is my use case or my application, 
and that's my hardware platform. So I got my ARM, I got accelerators, JXI, DRAM, and Flash. So what are we trying to do here? We have a complex mathematical processing, which is a detection for through an MPEG stream. And we're initially, we're trying to see if we can get it by implementing everything in hardware. So that way, I don't have to you know, build custom components or buy FPGAs or anything like that. I can just go ahead and take a piece of paper, SOC, and go ahead and implement it. So I go ahead and run the simulation. So you can see, I've got the processor, accelerator, the bus, the memory, the power management unit, and of course, the use cases. So when I run this, These are the two main plots that we're interested in. Actually, there's a couple of other plots also that we can discuss, but these two are the main, and there's another one that comes on later. But this shows me what's the instantaneous power plot. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the average power plot. This shows me what's the instant. So you can see at every instance in time, how much power was consumed by this particular SOC. Now you can see, obviously, most of it is you know sub 0.95, but you see these spikes. That also explains why it is really 0.95. But you can see these spikes, and you know your thermal has to be handling these worst case power uh, or worst case thermal impacts. Of course, this shows you what your performance is. Now, same model, but what I'm going to do is move this from going to software. We're going to move it to going to hardware. We run the same model. And we're going to see how the how how it gets impacted. So here, again, we're uh, looking at the uh, power consumption, the average, the instantaneous, the uh, the performance. But now something's changed. We've added the hardware accelerator, and the hardware accelerator is providing the uh, you know an additional layer of power power consumption. So if you look at the uh, system over here, you notice. There's a lot of these spikes, and most of the time the power is sitting up right here, which as a result has also caused my overall power to go up. But here's the important thing. I was at 1.35, now I'm at 1.6. So there's also an additional uh, aspect of these peak loading, which can impact the thermal, but can also impact the battery. Of course, the nice thing is this is more than doubled in performance. It went from 13,000 to almost 27,000 uh, uh, frames per second that we are 20 milliseconds into the process. What we can do is we can go ahead and add power management to the same system. And uh, we run the same. So if you notice, I started off with latency, I looked at my throughput, I looked at my power consumption, so it's kind of a trade off. But now what I've done is I've moved from that to your, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, looking at how exactly I need to implement it. Notice that this is the SOC. So we saw it at the network level. We saw the braking system. We saw it now at the uh, software level, how the software needs to be taken care of. And now we saw the mapping onto a hardware platform. So now if you look at this. The power is, you know, like there is some little bit of fluctuation, but it's kind of steady down at one watt of power. You can also notice here, thanks to my power management, I've been able to drop it down by the phase. Of course, you can see the, uh, you know, there's these few ranges, but you can see how it's gone down to the lower level. The spikes are still there. I mean, unless you change the way the sequencing and the ordering of the data is, the spikes are going to be there. So you do have to look at the next level of how you can minimize these spikes as well. They don't affect your uh, your average, but they do affect your uh, cooling cost. Of course, the performance change a little bit, but not significant. So it's not really an impact on your uh, system. Now, we we'll look at the last aspect, which is really the power and thermal. So here what we have is, we're looking at the distributed AI system, which is that we're, you know, we've got the wheel sensors, but we also have the road condition sensors, the proximity sensor. So we're not just depending on the brake pedal, but rather we're depending on something that uh, 
notices that there's certain distance between it and the um, vehicle in front of it, and it's looking at doing some processing right there, sending it off to the ECU, that's the processing right there, and then informing the wheels as to what to do. Either, you know, the engine say to accelerate or the wheels to say, uh, you know, decelerate the system by applying the brakes. Can be any of those kind of conditions. So going over and looking at that system model, And I apologize, we're taking about three to four minutes extra on this presentation. Uh, we started a few minutes late, so that was uh, be very good. So we're going to go ahead and uh, run the simulation. Now, one of the key things we're looking at here is, if you looked at the earlier model, we only looked at the uh, power consumed by instantaneous average, and then we looked at the uh, latencies. Now what has changed is that we're actually looking at the time the approximately sensor or a brake pedal was applied to the time it got to all the four wheels. That's the four different colors, the, the time taken to get to this. So what was the latency, latency across the entire system? Now, there's also some functional. For example, these were the expected road condition and did, did, my, approximate, did my road condition sensor put out the right data or did it put out the incorrect data? So that's something that could be as a result of ECC or the data arriving late on to my uh, uh, brake ECU can be any of those combinations of reasons. Of course, you can see the power, but now the main thing you want to look at is correctness. Is it uh, you know reading the data correctly? So you notice here the wheel one read the incorrect data. Here, for example, I'm doing the discharge and doing the charging of the battery. What was so we're looking at a hybrid system, so you know what happens during the discharge and looks at what's the voltage during the charging as well. So here, what you have is you no longer just have the latency across the network. You don't have just the processing capacity. You don't are not just doing the power, but actually you're looking at the overall system and how the overall system gets impacted by the design. Okay. So that's what you see. That's the inside of uh, one of the ECUs. In this case, the brake ECU we're using an uh, ARM uh, Cortex A33. And you saw all the statistics we were looking at. Now, a quick introduction to Merkle's designs. Uh, we've been around for over 15 years. Lots of awards over the years, variety of applications. We've got over 50 customers, and we have over 250 products that have been designed using Visual Set. The, uh, and more recently, we've gotten into things such as functional safety, expanding local support in Europe and Asia to be able to more effectively help our customers. Visuals, uh, Miracle's Design provides three levels of products. The visuals and software, the libraries, the ability for you to take the design, take your design, use our components, drag and drop them, and assemble up the full system. We also provide training. And the last one is where we provide new services where we can build components, which can be proprietary or off the shelf. We build uh, custom models, but we also give you feedback on your architecture by building these kind of models. Now, how does the uh, adoption of visual system really impact your uh, operation? The way it impacts it is many for one is, rather than spending a whole lot of time uh, looking at the creation of the model, you're spending less time creating the model and spending more time doing an analysis. The reason is the libraries, the accuracy of the blocks you already have, allow you to speed up your uh, model construction and also gives you a lot of flexibility. And you saw, I could just change a parameter, but it changes the, uh, the mapping. I could change the clock speed, it changes the, uh, you know, the impact and the buffering. So very quickly, I can do analysis so I can do my refinement before I start my implementation. As a result of that, two things happen. One is all my bottlenecks, all my bugs are uh, weeded out. So which means I can create, finish my project much earlier. Plus, as a result of that, I can increase the revenue because I've already, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, already done a lot of the groundwork and I'm, I'm close to market. 
So these are some of the major benefits that allow companies to want to adopt and start moving forward with visual sync. So with this, I'd like to end my presentation. Now, there are a few more questions and I'll be answering them in the order of uh, it's received. Now, one of the, the newest questions is, uh, what is a competition doing? As you saw what I, when I was showing you right up front, really the competition is doing it in analytical methods. So if you take an AI-based system, really the only way you can do it is you can do an Excel spreadsheet to say this is the traffic, this is the amount of processing, I add them up, I get results. Or I can buy a tensor uh, chip, put it on a board, run my application top of it. First one, highly inaccurate. Second one is it's going to take you a long time, like six months, nine months. And you can't really do that didn't work for you. Now you've got to rebuild a new prototype and try it all over again. Now, what are the other ways that people do it? Other ways is they just start directly by doing the control algorithms and see, you know, see what the algorithm is in and then figure out how to implement it. Most of the other tools in the market tend to be project management tools that manage all your software, you know, like SysML or, uh, you know, requirements gathering tools, or they're tools that allow you to, like, manage all your tests, manage all your C code, manage all your schematics, all of those. So a variety of those kind of tools. So really, that's where Miracle's Design is offering a new solution, which wasn't previously available because these other uh, solutions were mostly analytical products or analytical models. I'm still available out here to answer any questions. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, ask them and I'll be happy to answer those questions. It looks like there are a few more questions. Um, one of the questions is, is Merkel's design the only one doing it globally? Now, that's a difficult question to answer. There's always small custom solutions that have been developed by different companies to do it in-house. It's not like it's not being done at all, but those tend to be very proprietary and very specific for that particular problem. And it's also built not as a commercial product, but built either from an open source, like for example, network modeling, the tools like NS3, that you could take, create libraries, and build it for your own needs. But now, if you have to go to a different project within the company, you have to, uh, you know, you have to rebuild. Or for example, if I want to incorporate the hardware and software, or in the power system into it, or I want to look at the thermal effects, now I have to go to a different product. The product that I was using for my network modeling doesn't help. Is the only solution that captures the entire end-to-end -end design, and that's really where uh, the overall system behavior comes into play. So any more questions, feel free to uh, answer them.
again, once again, I want to apologize that this uh, webinar took over, went over a little bit. Uh, we had a lot more information to cover, and that's one of the reasons why it went over. Um, as I mentioned,